And we're going to continue that unashamed, unavowed anti-Zionism now with our brilliant professor, our local professor, David Miller. Hello, thank you for that. When I stood in court on the 16th of October last year and said, I'm David and I'm an anti-Zionist, then I, I didn't get a lot of people saying, you're very correct, David. But now, almost all of the country believes it. 55% of young people believe that Israel has no right to exist. And that figure is only increasing as every baby is killed, as every old person, as every civilian, and indeed as every fighter is killed in Gaza and indeed in uh, Lebanon. What we see today is the rising of the people of West Asia against the Zionist colony. We saw yesterday that more than 11 IDF uh, bodies were transported by helicopter out uh, to the hospitals. Uh, more, uh, tens of them were injured. And we saw this morning the Israelis trying to do an attack on Iran, which seems to have comprehensively failed. Two soldiers died, I understand, but comprehensively failed because Iran has effective air defense mechanisms unlike the Zionist entity. When the Iranians the other week flew, uh, uh, shot 200 missiles at the Zionists, what happened? Almost every single one hit their exact targets. The air defense system of Israel is a failure. So we now stand on the precipice, the precipice of the question of whether the Zionist colony is ended by the axis of resistance or not. It has to be ended. There is no possibility of peace with the Zionists. There can be no peace in West Asia with a Zionist colony present. It has to be eliminated and eliminated fast. Yesterday would, be, would not be soon enough. But of course, this is uh, a matter for the axis of resistance. We are not the axis of resistance. We might want to be part of or support in general, the axis of resistance and to do our part here. But what is our part here? Should we be just marching against the Z genocide? Well, no, of course we have to march. We have to march in Bristol, we have to march in London, we have to oppose Tommy Robinson. Yes, of course we have to do those things, but we have to escalate the cost against the, the people who are in charge of this country. That's, uh, what's he called? Keir Starmer, David Lammy. Yes, of course, we have to escalate the cost against them and we have to attack uh, and, and escalate the possibility of protest against the British government, against its military operations and support of the Zionists, against the intelligence flights that are sending over Gaza on a daily basis. We also have to escalate against the Zionists in this country. Uh, uh, Dr. Shola was quite correct. They have a long arm. There are Zionist organizations in this city. There are Zionist organizations in every city of this country. They need to be demobilized and decommissioned. They need to be finished and ended and their charitable status removed. So, so what, what, the thing I've been trying to say all, all along is that Zionism is not just a problem for the Palestinians, for the Lebanese, for the Syrians, for the Iraqis, for the Iranians, and of course, the brave brothers and sisters of Yemen. It's not just a problem for them. It's a problem here, because it, it's, it's the Zionists who are amongst the most important uh, can, uh, sources which push Islamophobia, the Islamophobia that we see on the streets today in London with the supporters of uh, Tommy, yes. Yaxley, Stephen, whatever his name is. <laughs> the Zionists have long arms, they can reach, they can, they can reach into the far right, they, they took the far right onto their side in 2007, 8 and 9 when they created the English Defence League. And they will continue to do that unless we push back against them. It's no use saying, this is fascism and we must fight fascism. Yes, these people are fascists, but they are fascists who support the Zionist entity and are put on the streets in order to support the Zionist entity. So we must oppose them and we must oppose the way in which Zionism penetrates everywhere else, in the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, in this city, in this, in Next and River Island, in all the places where Zionists make money to send bombs to kill children 
in Palestine. We must make sure that there can be from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are to draw a red line. A red line against violence. A red line against silence. A red line against the complete destruction of Gaza and a red line of dreams of complete colonization of the tiny piece of land. Yes, you heard it right. There are people in Israel right now rallying to make settlements on top of the rubble in Gaza where their bodies buried underneath still. So, you know, how satanic a society can get after that. So are you ready to make a red line against that? Yeah. Are you ready to be the red line today? Yeah. Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! So, a family in Bristol has asked us to share this harrowing account of one of their uh, relatives still stuck in Gaza. And I'm going to read this message to all of you. This week, the Israeli terrorists raided three of my auntie's homes, causing damage and showing off their power. They shot six young men in the camp, killing a 12-year-old kid. They kidnapped 20 young men. My eldest aunt died yesterday. The Israelis found out and knew that everybody was going together at grandfather's house the terrorists raided it in the morning, smashing the windows and ransacking it. They kidnapped my cousin, tied him, and threw him down a flight of stairs. He was last seen being dragged away, likely with broken bones. Please remember the all to your dwarfs and keep the momentum going. So let this message serve as a reminder. The magnitude of Israeli terror and hostility has exponentially gone up since 7th of October. And so our struggle and our resistance must go up by that much too. So make today count. Let's all be loud so that everybody can hear us say, from the river to the I'm wearing a, a vest here today. It says medic, not a target. Unfortunately, that's not the situation in Gaza. The targeting of hospitals and healthcare workers in Gaza by the Israeli military is one of the worst war crimes in recent history. Over 1,000 healthcare workers have been killed. Many healthcare workers have been arrested and imprisoned without charge. And healthcare workers are dying in prison as a result of torture. Every single hospital in Gaza has been either destroyed or is unable to function because of limited supplies. Children, unfortunately, who are the main Civilians injured in this conflict have horrific injuries. They have partially amputated limbs as a result of Israeli airstrikes, penetrating shrapnel wounds, third degree burns. And these children are suffering and dying this very moment in time because they cannot get access to health care. The situation in northern Gaza at this moment in time is particularly dire. UN has described it as the darkest moment in this conflict. The nightmare is intensifying. A whole population is being starved, is under siege. There's no food or supplies getting into this region for the last months. Medics in these hospitals are sending out SOS messages saying, where is the world? They can't look after the patients. They're turning off ventilators to support 
uh, children in intensive care because they do not have electricity. They do not have supplies or medicines to treat these patients. So this is what's happening in Gaza is not a war. It is a, a massacre. It is genocide. And we are all witness to this. The media will try to hide it, but it's there on social, on social media. So, so why is this happening? Well, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is that the Western politicians are complicit in this genocide. Shame on them! They, con they continue to arm Israel, continue to support Israel financially and politically, despite the horrific massacre that is happening now, despite the genocide. And what does this tell you about our political system, our politicians? Well, in my opinion, they are morally bankrupt. Hum human rights for them is just an empty phrase. It means nothing. They just use it when they need to. They are, in my opinion, terrorists yes. in suits. Yes. There is not a single day that I wake up in the morning and the first thoughts I have are about the suffering in Gaza and the injustice taking place there. There is global moral trauma. People are emotionally distressed by the continuing suffering and conflict taking place in Gaza. It needs to stop now. We all here have one thing in common. And you know what that is? That is a common humanity. The earth is but one country, and we are all its citizens. Doesn't matter what color, what religion, what background you are. And when we see the suffering in Gaza, it affects our humanity, because we recognize that these are human beings like us, and it is unjust what is happening. So what can we do about this? We are all standing here in solidarity for Palestinians. Okay. The fact that we are here means that we reject the message of hatred, of violence, of apartheid, of colonization, of racial superiority of one group or another. Yeah. So, So what, what do I want? What do we want? We don't want just a ceasefire. We want justice. Yes. Whoa. We want justice for the over the 13,000 children that have been killed in Gaza. That's one classroom of children killed every day for one year. We want justice for those children that have lost every single relative when they are orphaned. We want justice for those mothers that are holding their dead babies and looking and saying, what is happening? We want justice for the healthcare workers, for the journalists, for the aid workers that have been killed in Gaza. And we want justice because we do not want to see anything like this ever again. Thank you very much for listening to me. Despite the ongoing atrocities in Gaza, the continual human rights abuses, the daily massacres committed by the Israeli terror regime, I want to speak of a glimmer of hope. This glimmer lies in the young people of Gaza and the young people around the world who can actually bring about change. I'd like to introduce you to a 14-year-old boy, Gazan boy, called Obada Mohammed Abu Oda. And Obada has a poem in this book, and with all the other poems in this book, it's touring the UK and Ireland in its exhibition. If you buy a copy of the book, you'll see 
that Obada has decorated the poem beautifully with a heart. Not a love heart, he's decorated it with a human heart. And little did Obada know that a year ago yesterday, his heart would be stopped dead by an Israeli bomb bombing his home. Here is Obada's poem. I always dream of a life clear as the serenity of the sky and a heart beating with love of optimism. Why our smiles do not bloom like the flowers. Let us fly freely as those butterflies, satisfied, colorful and flapping sky high, away from worries, anxieties and sorrows. Rest in power, Obada. Most of the children who wrote poems for the book, we don't know if they're alive or dead. But sometimes we do get messages from some of the children. I'd like to play you a one minute message from a girl called Nada Migdad, who sent me this message a few days ago. She's now 16 years old. Her message is a response to me telling her that the poem that she wrote in the book is being shared all over the UK, is being seen by young people everywhere. When my family were happy and together under one roof with nothing could tear us apart, when I had living basics, which are now considered privileges, when I had dreams that I had the slightest chance of them coming reality, but now they're just silly dreams. But then I remember that the word is hearing me, reading what I wrote and listening to what I say, lighting that little burning flame inside of me that is hoping that everything will get better, that, I'm, that I'll make a better change in the world someday, that, some, that someday I'll be lighting that flame inside of those broken children's heart. I refuse to ever give up my dreams. Nothing will ever make me think I wasn't worthy of them or not capable of them coming true. It doesn't matter how many times I fail or fall, I will always get up and try again. What's actually keeping me together is knowing that I'm heard and my word is reaching to the word. So thanks to everyone making that possible. Ooh. The situation is getting desperate, desperate, desperate. We, this calls for desperate measures. If you are a young person, I would ask you to stop going to school now. If you are a university student, stop going to university. If you're a teacher, stop going to work. Whoever you are, stop everything. We need a general strike. We need our government to stop being complicit in the genocide in Gaza, and we need it now. When she looks at me, all she sees is craters the 8,000 houses and all the children of her nearest neighbours, the ones she grew up with and shared a bath with, the ones she giggled with in English classes. She sees Fatima with her unicorns and thick glasses, Fatima with her kindness and her silly dances. She sees Fatima laying grey with her body in a twisted mess, her face replaced with something hideous. Fatima, she says, I hold my cup. Wish I could hold her too, but she could not be touched. Because every fingertip's a missile to her now. And even the daylight's a blade that leaves a jagged cut. They told her to evacuate, but where to go? When they're bombing hospitals and bombing roads. She is just 14, she should be scared of ghosts. Not tangled in a terror, seeing shrapnel in her parents' throats. And bloody matted hair and bone scattered on the kitchen cabinet while sirens scream over the aerodrome. Her hands tremble, her teeth chatter and her face is creased. So tired but there's nowhere left that's safe to sleep. And in her eyes I see there never will be and it kills me. Shame on my government and shame on me. With the fumes from the fires in Jabalia still fresh in our minds. And burning bodies in tents and hospitals and parents picking up pieces of their children's bodies 
and children orphaned, hungry, starving, moving from the north to the south. As we see Gaza burning, people under the rubble, now they have invaded Lebanon. They are bombing Syria. They are after Yemen because the plan was never about the hostages. It's about the land. It always has been. And we knew that. And we must remember it. And as we see a live streamed genocide on our TV screens and our social media, and as we see Stalmer's government and mainstream media telling us about Israel's right to defend itself. And as we see over 50,000 people officially murdered, but many under the rubble, many in, under famine now, with starvation having set in, we must ask ourselves, what is the turning point? I thought the people were the frame under which you unite. And we must reclaim that frame. We must not give up hope. We must look to the people around us and form stronger bonds. And we must remember that when they say 7th October, we ask the question, what about 6th October? What about 5th October? And what about 75 years of occupation? <laughs> what about apartheid? What about an imperial power in the US and the UK and Europe that supports Israel to do what it does? And how do we hold our governments accountable? We must remember the recent bombing of Kamal Edwan Hospital and the Al Farah family in the southern part of Gaza that have all just recently been killed by our taxpayers' money. We must ask our government, not in London, but here from Bristol, in any way we can, how? Can you do this in our name? We thought the apartheid ended with South Africa. We thought colonialism ended with India. But it has not. And our duty is today to resist, to question, to dissent, to protest, to march, to organize, and say no apartheid, no genocide, no besieging of people, and no deciding that they are, that Ukrainian lives matter, but Palestinian lives don't matter. Oh. We must remember the words of Martin Luther King when he said that no lie can live forever. We must remember that Gaza is the moral conscience of the world now that it has laid bare the hypocrisy and it has exposed the world and it has exposed the empire. And we must also remember that international instruments that we thought were there to protect people are tools of the powerful against the powerless. And they are all done in our name. When they said never again, they meant only about a certain race, a certain color of people. They want us to believe that Palestinian lives, that Lebanese lives, that Yemeni lives, that Syrian lives don't matter, that those are not civilians. Ukrainians are civilians, but they are not. We must reset the frame and not let them do it for us. 
Because Gaza has also taught us that it, it is we that need Gaza. They don't need us. They have been fighting occupation for the last 70 years, 76 years. Whoa. If we want to keep our humanity, we must come together and we must make apartheid expensive. We must make it unaffordable, economically, socially, politically. This is what Gaza has taught us, that it is the fault line on which the world stands today. The world will not look like what it used to. And we must ensure that Gaza stays at the forefront of our minds and our thoughts and our actions. So now and forever, long live Palestine and long live the resistance. Leading the march today will be this banner uh, with the name of Shaban al Dula. And also joining us shortly will be the Red Rebels. If you haven't seen the Red Rebels before, they are in red scarlet, the blood that unites all of humanity, and they are beyond humanity. They are witnesses to what's happening here. And when you see them, uh, a round of applause, please, but they are very moving. And they will be marching at the front on either side of the banner. And uh, if you haven't heard, because it takes time for everything to go round on the media networks, Shaban was a 19-year-old, lovely young man living in Gaza with his family, an articulate, intelligent teenager, and he was studying to be a software engineer. A week ago, Monday, that was the 14th of October, Shaban, was, as far as we know from the media, was on a drip, an intravenous drip, receiving treatment uh, in a tent in the grounds of the Al-Aqsa Hospital in Gaza. He was lying on a bed when the Israelis bombed the compound. People shot videos of this horrific scene as Shaban and others, but Shaban was frantically waving his arms, still attached to his drip, before being engulfed by the flames. These videos have gone viral on social media and have been seen by millions around the world, finally forcing the mainstream news outlets to cover it in their way. The horror of that moment has touched people's hearts. The death toll in Gaza already is truly staggering. Let's remind ourselves that at least 40,000 have been killed. There might be another 10,000 bodies crushed under the rubble. And many more will die due to what medics call indirect deaths, due to the destruction of hospitals, healthcare, sanitation, water supplies, and other essentials of life. The Lancet has estimated the final death toll already, if the killing stopped now, might be 200,000. Others have weighed in with higher estimates, up to a third of a million, and maybe beyond. And as we know, the killing isn't stopping now. Israel is using starvation as a weapon and clearing, let's call it ethnically cleansing, northern Gaza. It can be hard to comprehend these terrible and colossal numbers. But if there is any hope in this, it's that in every long struggle against injustice, there do come these galvanizing moments. The Amritsar massacre in India, the Sharkville massacre, the Soweto massacres in South Africa, those, remember those pictures of those napalmed children in Vietnam and many others. And then for a moment, people stop their busy lives and pause and take moments, take notice. So perhaps the tra tragic death of Saban Aldula might be one of another one of these galvanizing moments. So that's why we honor his name in the march today. Shaban al Dula, say his name. Shaban al Dula. Shaban al Dula, say his name. Shaban al Dula.